going on in the sermon uh, in terms of our uh, festival plans, as far as I know, uh, as of uh, yesterday, so uh, that's uh, pretty up to date. Uh, but uh, anyway, my wife and I are going to be traveling out to uh, Colorado, to Snowmass, Colorado, uh, to open the feast. I've been asked to uh, take the first half of the feast there in Snowmass and then to travel on to uh, Del Mar, California, and we'll be in Del Mar for the second half of the feast. So uh, anyway, I'll miss uh, being there with you, unless some of you, uh, you know, some of you may want to transfer. You, you don't have to go to Florida. You know, it's not, not absolutely required. Uh, you can, uh, uh, some of you may be interested in going to some of the other sites. Uh, there are uh, some that are some very beautiful, enjoyable areas. Uh, so anyway, we're looking forward to that, and perhaps have a chance while we're in in Del Mar, maybe to see the new headquarters in San Diego. That's very, uh, very close. Uh, so uh, we'll, uh, anyway, be out there. At least as things are scheduled right now, uh, things can uh, always be revised, but uh, that's the way it's scheduled. And as far as I know, you'll have, uh, in Destin, you'll have Mr. Meredith and you'll have Mr. Larry Salyer. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm, uh, I have not seen the complete uh, festival schedule, so I don't know exactly where everybody's going to be, but... Uh, I think Mr. Meredith and Mr. Sally will be in Destin uh, for each for at least part of the feast. Uh, and so, uh, anyway, uh, the uh, Mr. Raymond McNair is going to be in Del Mar for the first half of the feast. I don't know where he's going to be for the second half. Uh, I haven't seen the complete list. I just know that he's going to be there for the first half because I'll be uh, uh, taking his slot uh, there for the second half. Mr. Meredith is scheduled to be in uh, uh, Lake Placid, New York for uh, the first part of the feast, and then coming on to Destin. Mr. Salyer is going to be in uh, uh, Des Moines for part of the feast, and, and also in uh, Destin for part. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, I haven't, uh, I'm not exactly sure where uh, some of the others are going to be going. We're focusing in on the feast and talking about that. I don't know if you've gotten out a calendar and looked. But you know, God's festivals are getting pretty close. Do you realize there are 45 days from now until the Feast of Trumpets? 45 days, that's just over six weeks from now until the Feast of Trumpets. So we are really just on the on the verge of, of the fall festival season. We're right here at that point. By the way, Feast of Trumpets uh, uh, will be uh, in Lafayette for combined service. Uh, I think Scott Lions Club, if I remember correctly. Uh, so uh, uh, that uh, you know ahead of time uh, now uh, that uh, we'll be giving announcements on that as the time approaches. But we're getting very close. The time is approaching. 45 days away uh, from uh, the Feast of Trumpets. Uh, traditionally, God's festivals, when you go through and study in the scriptures and study uh, the events that took place in conjunction with the festivals, you find that over and over again, God's festivals are times of dedication, times of rededication, times of renewal, uh, times of a spiritual renewal and a spiritual refocusing. Many events are associated with God's festivals and play a very important role. And I think it is important as we approach the festival season and as we're uh, in the uh, hustle and bustle of our, uh, of our preparations, of our uh, housing arrangements, of planning our travel arrangements, the whole, uh, the whole gamut of just physical details that you've got to work out uh, in order to go and to do something. It's good to step back and get a perspective and to realize uh, from a little broader view. When we pick up the story in the book of 1 Kings, we read of the ups and downs of the kingdoms of Judah and Israel. Primarily, Judah is focused upon, at least particularly in the books of Chronicles. Uh, a little more is told about northern Israel in the books of Kings. But in the book of 1 Kings, we find that uh, uh, as, as we uh, uh, come on down here in chapter 14 of 1 Kings, uh, 
and verse 30, that there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all their days. And Rehoboam slept with his fathers. He, he was married. And Abijah, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, if you remember, when King Solomon died, Rehoboam, his son, was to succeed to the throne. And because of Rehoboam's mishandling of a situation, northern Israel appointed Jeroboam as their king. And so you have the beginning of the parallel history between Israel and Judah. And Judah uh, under Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, and uh, then Jeroboam in Israel. Now, as you come on down, we find that, uh, Jeroboam, uh, that first Rehoboam died, and his son Abijah became king. And Abijah uh, reigned over Judah. And we're told in, in uh, chapter 15 and verse 2 that Abijah uh, reigned for three years, and he died. And in verse 8, uh, he was buried. And Asa, his son, reigned in his stead. In verse 9 of chapter 15, this was the 20th year uh, of Jeroboam that Asa became king. So here we are now, 20 years downstream from Solomon's death, and Asa has become king. Now, 20 years is not that long a period of time. We just, uh, within the last week or so, just celebrated the uh, one week uh, or the, the 25 year anniversary of the moon landing. And that, uh, of course, was a very striking event for uh, all of those of us who remember it. And I guess probably uh, at least a large segment of us here remember that, probably have very vivid memories of it. 20 years is not that long ago. That's 1974. Well, here we are. 20, Solomon has only been dead 20 years. We've moved downstream. Uh, this 20-year period, and Asa has become king. Asa was actually the great-grandson of King Solomon because there have been some fairly quick successions. And Asa became king, and we find that in verse 11 that Asa did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, as did David his father, or his ancestor. Actually, David was the great-great-grandfather of King Asa, though... Uh, from the time of David's death until Asa became king was a period of only 60 years. A period of only 60 years. That's like, what, 1934 till now. So, uh, you know, the time that Franklin Roosevelt became president uh, on down to, to, to now, which is uh, in a lot of ways, a lot of history, a lot of things have happened, uh, yet uh, not something that, uh, uh, you know, not a gigantic amount in, in terms of time, because certainly... Uh, you know, some of you uh, have memory of that. The uh, Asa became king, and he sought to, to copy his ancestor David. In verse 12, he took away the Sodomites out of the land. That was one of the things he started with. And uh, he removed all the idols that his fathers had made. So here we find that his predecessors had actually built up all this idolatry. They built up idol images. His mother, or literally his grandmother, the Hebrew word uh, that is translated mother here is a word that uh, in a, can refer in a general sense to any female ancestor, uh, mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. Uh, if you go back and tie it in with other scriptures, you'll find that this uh, uh, Makah was the wife of Rehoboam, and therefore the grandmother, literally, of, of Asa. She was the queen mother. And he removed her from this position because she had made an idol in a grove. So she actually had this idol image, and Asa knew that there was no way that he could straighten the land out. He couldn't put things back on the track and have the queen mother, someone in a, in a position of authority, uh, actually setting this example. So he a actually had to start with his grandmother's idol. Uh, and uh, uh, one, the verse back in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, tells us it was an abominable idol. If you look that up, commentaries uh, describe uh, that uh, expression referring to uh, things that were obscene. And if you look at a little bit, read a little bit about some of the idolatrous cults of the Canaanites, you realize that a lot of it got into fertility uh, symbolisms, and some of them were just uh, grossly, uh, blatantly obscene. And that evidently was the kind of idol she had up in this grove, and he destroyed it. He burned it. Uh, stamped it to dust and threw it in the brook. So he got rid of that. Uh, he did not remove all of the high places, but evidently, certainly those in the environs of Jerusalem, he did at a little later time, as we're going to see. Uh, his, his attitude was right, was sincere. 
with the eternal all his days. Now, let's come on back to the parallel account in Second Chronicles. I want to show you a little bit more. In, in chapter 14 of Second Chronicles, verse 1, uh, we find that Abijah slept with his fathers and Asa reigned in his stead. And in his days, the land was quiet ten years. When Asa became king, uh, things were quiet. Asa did that which was good and right in the sight of the eternal his God. He took away the altars of the strange gods in the high places. He broke down the images and cut down the groves. So he began to take action to stamp out idolatry. The first thing he did was take away the altars to the strange gods. The altars to Baal. The altars to Ashtaroth. The altars to the various pagan gods of the Egyptians and the Canaanites. The first thing he did was to destroy those. Well, the high places were places that had been set up ostensibly for the worship of the God of Israel. But they were not sanctioned according to the law. They were just people uh, sort of doing it the way it seemed a good idea to them. A lot of times blending various customs together. Uh, he got rid of the images. He didn't take them down and say, oh, aren't they nice? You know, let's just put them up on the wall for a souvenir. He understood that these things were abominable in God's sight. So, he commanded Judah to seek the eternal God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandments. So, the kingdom here, he, he took away out of all the cities of Judah, the high places and the images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. He built fenced cities in Judah, for the land had rest. He had no war in those years, because the Eternal had given him rest. So, um, things went along fairly smoothly. Now, we come along in verse 9, and we find that there arose this army of Zerah the Ethiopian, who put together an army of one million men. Now, Zerah had put together quite an empire. Uh, if you look at a map of Africa, you see that there is a spot down on the east coast of Africa where the coast of Africa uh, and the uh, Arabian Peninsula almost meet, coming right down at the bottom of the Red Sea. Uh, it's called the, uh, the Straits of Aden, uh, A-D-E-N, uh, right down there where the coast of Africa and, and the coast of Ara uh, the Arabian Peninsula almost meet. Uh, well, uh, Zara's army, or Zara's uh, empire, extended there this eastern part of Africa coming up through uh, that whole section up through Ethiopia and into uh, uh, Egypt. You know, that was uh, at certain times uh, when it was hooked up with a, with a larger area, it, it was quite a, a rich empire because that you know, of the trading routes. You know, if you look right there on the Arabian Peninsula, all of the, uh, the, the spices, and spices were a very precious and important commodity at that time uh, for various reasons, one of which, of course, I had to do with the preservation of food back in times prior to refrigeration. Uh, spices played a very, uh, a very important role in uh, terms of uh, uh, pres uh, preservation of food and things of this sort. But anyway, you had this, this trade there around the Arabian Peninsula and, and the ships that could fly all the way from India through the Persian Gulf and down around the coast of the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, and they had to come there through the Straits of Aden to come up the Red Sea to come up to Egypt. And so whoever controlled this area uh, was in a position to really control the trade routes uh, from the Near East across into the Middle East. And uh, Zerah had put together this great empire uh, there over in the Arabian Peninsula in the eastern part of Africa up through Egypt, put together this great empire, this great army, and now he was prepared to invade the Middle East. And if you're going to invade the Middle East coming up from Egypt, the first thing you have to go through is Judah. So Asa was in a bad spot. Here was this gigantic army on their way to conquest of the whole Middle Eastern area. And Asa and his little kingdom stood in their way. And Zerah came with this huge army. And Asa, in verse 10, went out to meet him. And he recognized that he was hopelessly outnumbered. But it wasn't hopeless in Asa's sight, because in verse 11, Asa cried unto the Eternal is God. He said, Eternal, it is nothing with you to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, 
O eternal our God, for we rest in you. We rest on you. And in your name we go out against this multitude. You're our God. Let not man prevail against you. So we're told that the eternal smote the Ethiopians before Asa, and they fled. So here God intervened. God heard his prayer. God intervened in a very dramatic way. And uh, Zerah's schemes of world conquest were put to naught. Uh, and Asa was delivered, not because he had such a great army and not because he was such a skilled general, but because he looked to God and relied on God, and Asa had been trying to seek God. Well, now God's prophet came out, chapter 15. Uh, God's prophet, uh, Azariah, came out to meet Asa in chapter 15 and verse 2, and he said, The Eternal is with you while you be with him. And if you seek him, he will be found of you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Now that is an important key. You know, we, we have heard and we have read the scripture many times that God will not leave us nor forsake us. That is true. But it's conditional if you forsake God. God will forsake you uh, until you turn to Him. We can't uh, hold God hostage and say that God, uh, God has to uh, has to bless us because uh, you know we, we just think that, that He does. Uh, it's a matter that God's promises are conditioned, and they are conditioned upon our seeking Him and obeying Him and serving Him. So He said, "God is with you if you're with Him." He'll be found of you if you seek him. If you forsake him, he'll forsake you. For a long season Israel has been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. A long time. Now, as we come on down, we find that um, uh, things had peace for the first ten years of uh, uh, Asa's reign, and then all these troubles started. And we find in verse 10 of chapter 15 uh, that uh, we come on down to the 15th year of the reign of Asa when this real revival that Asa led took place. So from the death of Solomon until the time Asa became king was 20 years. From the death of Solomon until uh, this revival here in chapter 15 and verse 10, 15 years into Asa's reign was a period of 35 years. He says, for a long time Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest. They had been off the track for a long time. Certainly, the 20 years prior to the beginning of Asa's reign, and you know really the last few years of Solomon's reign. Years had gone by. Decades had gone by. Things had gotten further and further off track. So Asa was told by the priest, or by the prophet, what he was to do. You see, Israel has turned away from God, has been without a teaching priest, without law. Verse 4, When they in their trouble did turn unto the eternal God of Israel and sought him, he was found of them. And in those days there was no place, uh, there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in. Great vexation uh, were upon all the inhabitants of the country. Nation was destroyed of nation, city of city. God did vex them with all adversity. Be strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, and your work shall be rewarded. So this was the message that Asa was given. He said, look, you can look around. You can see what trouble. You can see the turmoil. You can see the difficulty. There's been this massive invasion that has come in and just terrorized people. And God has delivered you because you sought to Him. Now, Asa had taken some very important corrective action. He had abolished the idolatrous altars throughout the land. He had taken some positive actions, but a period of years had gone by. Ten years went by, and Asa eliminated a lot of the negatives, but he got sidetracked. He started building up tent cities, and he started doing various things, and he didn't get around to doing all of the positive things that needed to be doing, and so then various difficulties and problems and just increasing strife and turmoil came over the next five years, culminating in this great invasion from which God delivered them. And then God sent a prophet, and he said, Asa, you started out fine, but you really need to get on track. 
People need the law of God. They need a teaching priest. And if you'll seek God, if you'll really seek God and seek God's way, God will be found and God will answer and God will deliver. You know, that was always... That was always the key. So, we find what, what happened. Verse 8, 2, Kings 5, or 2 Chronicles 15. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage. And he put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim. And he renewed the altar of the eternal that was before the porch of the eternal. Asa had evidently not worshipped the idolatrous images, had taken certain action when he first became king, but had not really followed it up. And because he didn't really replace the negative with a positive, people drifted back into their old customs. Old customs and old attitudes die hard. So now, Asa was stirred up, and he took courage. And he got rid of all the idolatry and all of these things. He renewed the altar of the eternal, rededicated God's altar. In verse 9, he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the eternal is God was with him. Asa stood up for what was right, and as he did, more and more of the people from Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon and various of the tribes began to come there because they wanted to be a part of where the living work of God was and where God was blessing. In verse 10, So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month. Now the third month is the month of Pentecost. They gathered themselves in the, month, in, in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa, and they offered unto the eternal the same time the spoil which they had brought, uh, 700 oxen and 7,000 sheep, and they entered into a covenant to seek the eternal God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. So they rededicated themselves to God. It was a renewal of the covenant into which their forefathers had entered on the day of Pentecost so many centuries earlier. We see that this first revival, this first period of renewal, of spiritual renewal focused in at the time of one of God's festivals. Pentecost of the 15th year of Asa. 35 years after the death of King Solomon. 35 years after the death of King Solomon. 75 years after the death of King David. A time of renewal. A time of revival and restoration. A time when the people rededicated themselves to God and to God's way. And it was in the context of a rededication to the law of God. To the law of God. Because you cannot separate the service to God from a knowledge of, of God's law. Let's, let's go back a little further. We see here this period of of revival, this period of restoration, this period of renewal. What set the stage for it? Asa became king 20 years after Solomon had died. Solomon, why, he was the one that built the great temple. How did things get off the track when Solomon uh, had built this great temple? Well, you can read the story of Solomon and the temple. In uh, First Kings, uh, you... you uh, you read of Solomon and, and the temple. You read in First Kings chapter 6 that in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign, uh, he began to build the house of the eternal. Now, King David had made the preparations. Solomon began the building of it during the fourth year of his reign. On down in verse 37 of First Kings 6, in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the eternal laid, in the month Zith, which is the second month. And in the eleventh year, in the month Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof, according to the fashion of it. It was seven years in building. Actually, seven and a half. Now, Solomon built this house, built this great temple. And it describes all of the things that were done 
and that uh, in chapter 7 and verse 51, so was ended all the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated. The silver, the gold, the vessels that he put in the treasures of the house of the Lord. And he brought it all. He assembled the elders. And uh, verse 2 of chapter 8, all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto King Solomon at the feast in the month Ephanim, which is the seventh month. Oh, the seventh month. What feast comes in the seventh month? Well, that's the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what's upcoming. So Solomon had built the temple, and the temple had been completed in the, in the eighth month of Solomon's eleventh year. Then, through the months, uh, the, the following months, all of the, uh, the items were brought into the temple, and everything was gotten ready. And now the dedication of the temple uh, is, is several months, almost a year, after the temple was finished. Uh, the temple is dedicated here at the feast of Solomon's twelfth year. But you know, the Bible uses numbers in a significant way, and the 12, uh, 12 is the number of organized beginnings. So here was what should have been the organized beginning of Solomon's reign, of Solomon's kingdom. And here at the Feast of Tabernacles of Solomon's 12th year as king is the dedication of the great house of God. The ark is brought in, and all of these things, and you have recorded uh, Solomon's prayer. Chronicles gives a more... A detailed account in terms of uh, um, uh, going through uh, some of that in, in uh, Second Chronicles, uh, where it gives the uh, uh, more of the uh, specific details when uh, it talks about in Second Chronicles chapter five and Second Chronicles chapter six, uh, and we find that uh, uh, in Second uh, Chronicles seven one. Chapter 6 of Second Chronicles is Solomon's prayer of dedication. And in chapter 7, verse 1 of Second Chronicles, When Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Eternal filled the house. Can you imagine standing out there? Hundreds of thousands of people assembled. Hundreds of thousands of people Everyone that could crowd in around the environs of Jerusalem. And, of course, those who could pack into the, the temple precincts themselves, into the courtyard, and actually hear Solomon's address. And others were back at a distance uh, as they could uh, try to, to see and, and, and be aware of what was going on. And here they're waiting, and Solomon is there. And he addresses the crowd and he prays this great prayer to God. And then all of a sudden, everyone, whether they could hear Solomon or not, everyone all of a sudden looks up and here is this great flashing bolt of fire coming down out of heaven and strikes there on the altar and ignites the altar, consumes the sacrifice. And the glory of the eternal filled the house. The glory of the eternal filled the the house. In fact, in verse 2, we're told the priest couldn't enter into the house of God because the glory of the eternal had filled the eternal's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the eternal upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised God, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever. The king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 oxen, 120,000 sheep. The king and all the people dedicated the house of God. And so you read on down in verse 8, Solomon kept the feast seven days and all Israel with him, a great congregation. And on the eighth day was a solemn assembly. So here... we find about this, this tremendous dedication of the temple. Tremendous event. People were overwhelmed. Just imagine the awesome spectacle of God literally sending fire down from heaven and igniting the sacrifice and consuming it. People were overawed and overwhelmed. Tremendous event. Surely God was there. God accepted that. God placed His stamp of approval there. 
Brethren, this was the twelfth year of Solomon. Twenty years after Solomon's death. The temple was empty. This was the twelfth year of Solomon. Solomon reigned twenty-eight more years. Twenty years after Solomon's death, the temple was empty. There were idol altars all over the place and had been for years. It doesn't take people long to get off track. It doesn't take people long here, here in this context. What do you have? A tremendous, impressive miracle. Oh, people would never forget that, would they? Well, let's just turn the page here. In 1 Kings 10. You read of the abundance and the riches that Solomon had and all the things it describes here in, in 1 Kings chapter 10. And in, verse, in chapter 11, it describes the wealth and the grandeur of Solomon. In chapter 11 of 1 Kings, verse 1, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Eternal had said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave to these in love. In verse 4, it came to pass when he was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the eternal his God as with the heart of David his father. And we find that Solomon allowed idol altars to be built. He built them for his wives. That in Solomon's latter years, we're told in verse 9 of chapter 11 that the eternal was angry with Solomon. God was told, told him here in verse 11, is you, this is done. You've not kept my covenant and my statutes. I'm going to take the kingdom from you. Not in your lifetime because of the promise I made to David and not completely because of the promise I made to David. But in verse 14, Sol, the Lord stirred up an adversary to Solomon. And when Solomon died, the kingdom was split between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Rehoboam, his, Solomon's son, took the southern kingdom Jeroboam took the northern part. Twenty years later, Asa became king. And things were in a deplorable state. Things were in a deplorable state. Here Solomon's reign started out as though it were going to be a foretaste of the world to come. A foretaste. The dedication of the temple all of the peace, all of the abundance, all of the prosperity, all of the so many things. What happened? Well, you know, God made promises, but you can go back to the book of Deuteronomy, and this is where it ties in with the feast, because we saw that it was, it was at the feast. It was the feast of Pentecost in Asa's 15th year that a renewal of the covenant was made. The temple was dedicated. The Feast of Tabernacles of Solomon's twelfth year. Years went by. Years went by. In fact, from the time of Solomon's dedication of the temple until the time that Asa rededicated it was 63 years. Take us back, you know, that'd be like something that occurred back in 1931. You know, not a whole lot of people around have uh, remember a whole lot further back than that. Some of you sitting here remember events back at that time. A lot has happened. A lot has happened in the history of this country since 1931. The nation has gone through a number of things. Well, that from the time of Solomon's dedication until the time that Asa rededicated the temple. So people who had a memory of Solomon's dedication would have been well advanced in years if they were old enough to have remembered, uh, remembered that and remembered uh, to have been there present. Uh, they would be uh, getting on up in years to have seen that rededication. And they saw how things got off the track. You know, when, 
At the end of Moses' life, we'll notice here in, in Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy 31, God inspired Moses to tell the children of Israel uh, in verse 3 of Deuteronomy 31 that the eternal your God, He will go over before you and He will destroy the nations from before you and you will possess them and Joshua shall go over before you. And we're told that uh, uh, in verse 6, Moses admonished, he said, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not. Don't be afraid of them, for the eternal, your God, He it is that does go with you, and He will not fail you nor forsake you. See, again, that's the key. God won't fail us. God won't let us down. God won't forsake us. God is not the problem. So Moses told Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage. You must go with His people unto the land which the Lord has sworn unto their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. So, the Lord, uh, He it is that will go before you. He will, do, he will be with you. He will not fail you. Neither forsake you. Fear not. Neither be dismayed. And now notice in verse 9, And Moses wrote this law, and he delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bore the ark of the covenant of the eternal, unto all and unto all the elders of Israel. So Moses now wrote the book of the law. He gave them the copy of the scriptures that existed at that time, the first five books of the Bible. He told them, God won't fail you. God won't let you down. Go forward. But notice now, let's just, just hold your place and turn over a couple of pages. In Joshua chapter 1, we find that God told Joshua almost identically the same thing. He told him, he said, Moses, my servant is dead. This is chapter 1, verse 2. Arise and go over Jordan. He told Joshua down in verse 5, Nobody will be able to stand before you. Uh, I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Be strong and of a good courage. Verse 7, Be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wheresoever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shall you make your way prosperous, and then shall you have good success. You see, when God says He will not fail us or forsake us, it is contingent on the fact that we will continue in the way of God. We will continue to follow God's way. We will be faithful and loyal to Him based upon God's law. Now, that's what Solomon lost sight of. That's what the people lost sight of with all of the glory and all of the grandeur and all of the might and all of the things that Solomon did. The people lost sight of what it was that gave them their connection to God. It wasn't a beautiful building. It was walking in the ways of God. They lost sight of God's ways. They forsook God. And God allowed them to suffer before their enemies. Now let's just turn back here to Deuteronomy 31. What does all this have to do with the feast? Well, notice in Deuteronomy 31.9, Moses wrote the law and delivered it to the priests, which bore the Ark of the Covenant. And verse 10, Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel has come to appear before the Eternal your God in the place which He shall choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Gather the people together, men and women and children, the stranger that's within your gates, that they may hear, that they may learn, and fear the eternal your God, and observe to do all the words of this law. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn and fear the eternal your God as long as you live in this land. So notice the sequence. Notice what was, what was in mind. The law was reread to the people. From the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy, it was reread every seven 
years. You know, everybody didn't have available their own copy of the Bible. There was the official temple scroll. And the priests, the Levites, were instructed in it. And there were to be teaching priests throughout the land, the various Levitical cities, so that the people could be taught and instructed. You see, the tendency of human nature is to forget. If people aren't continually reminded over and over and over, the tendency of human nature is to forget. You know, we have to, first, we have to have it explained. We have to understand. Sometimes people do things because they simply don't know better. Some people need to be, uh, need to be educated. They just need to be informed and taught. Some who have been informed and taught uh, maybe grow a little careless, a little neglectful, and they need to be admonished. They need to be exhorted and sort of stirred up to think about, to remember, to act on things they've heard and known before, but have just sort of grown a little careless with. Because that's a tendency of human nature. So some people need to be taught and educated to begin with. Others need to be exhorted and admonished. And, of course, there are others who need to be rebuked and warned. Because it's not just uh, a little bit of of laxity or carelessness on their part. Uh, It's a matter that they have uh, simply gotten off track and uh, are doing things directly contrary. And there are some who uh, who need to be warned and rebuked. And God provides for all of it there in the Scriptures. But the starting point is to instruct. You know, you don't start out by by rebuking and warning someone who's never heard and doesn't understand. The problem is, of course, most people haven't acted on what they did understand. So the things that they, uh, uh, you you know, if they haven't acted on what they did understand, it casts doubt on the fact that they would do a whole lot better if they understood a little more. But the key is the law of God. You see, the key to God continuing to bless the nation and when Joshua led them in, the key to God's blessing, the key to their success was obedience to God. And God directed that at the Feast of Tabernacles there was to be a refocus on the law. And that every seven years the entirety of the law would be gone through. So that people would be refreshed and they would hear things and be exhorted and instructed Uh, all along, but every seven years they would go back through the whole thing from start to finish. This is an important aspect, and it points up an important aspect of the feast. Because God intended the festival. He intended His festivals not merely to be times of of, uh, vacation, not merely times uh, where people go uh, exotic places and eat... uh, Uh, great meals. God intended His festivals to be times of spiritual renewal. Times of spiritual rededication. You can go through the story here in uh, uh, over and over. I mean, you find here in 2 Chronicles 15, you you read about Asa. Uh, We could go on uh, a little further in uh, 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 30, and you read about the great reform of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, which was uh, a period of time, uh, you know, a period of time later that uh, uh, that, that occurred, that uh, uh, as uh, time uh, comes on down quite a number of decades later, and the great revival that occurred under uh, under Hezekiah, and you read in, in uh, Second Chronicles thirty one or, or thirty, excuse me, uh, verse twenty six. There was great joy in Jerusalem, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. This is speaking of the great Passover of the time of Hezekiah. So there was a time of great renewal. And the Passover of Hezekiah, we're told, dwarfed any Passover celebration that had been held since the time of Solomon. The time of Solomon had been almost two centuries previous to the time of Hezekiah. We come on over a few pages here in Second Chronicles, and we find 
In Second Chronicles chapter 35, we read about Josiah. This comes on down about another 75 years later, or 60 to 75 years later, and we find that, that it, there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. So here was a time of renewal and rededication at the time of Josiah that dwarfed anything that had occurred since the days of, of Samuel the prophet. Now that really stretched back. But you can go on over to, the, to uh, Ezra, the book of Ezra, and you can read about the Feast of Tabernacles that was celebrated there at a time of, of rededication there in, in Ezra and Nehemiah. Read of, of a Feast of Tabernacles there and how they did everything just exactly as the law said. And you find that they hadn't done so since the days of Joshua. Now that sort of, does that give you the idea that most of the time when Israel observed the feast, they just went through the motions? They didn't have... You know, just a real spiritual feast. Most of the time, what they had was just simply a matter of of uh, going through uh, going through the motions. You know, we're told just if you want the reference in your notes, uh, Nehemiah eight verse seventeen. Uh, we're told uh, uh, that the congregation uh, of them that were come, come out of the captivity made booths and sat under booths for since the days of Joshua the son of Nun until that day had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. They hadn't done it exactly the way it was supposed to be done for centuries. For centuries. But you know, when you do what God says, there's gladness. Oh, they kept the feast. They kept the feast, but, you know, they, they, they hadn't, it hadn't been with the same spirit, the same attitude, the same exactness. You see, the feast was supposed to be a time of renewal, but the feast generally was just a time of going through the motions. That was a time of making a trip and, and uh, uh, you know, eating high on the ox or high on the sheep. They didn't eat high on the hog. Uh, but uh, some of us used to, but we don't anymore either. Uh you know, it was a time of enjoyment. It was a festive time, a happy time, an exciting time. But in terms of what God really intended the festival to be, they just went through the motions. They showed up, and they were there, and they had a good time with their friends, and they went home. But the festival was only, on rare occasions, times of real spiritual renewal for the people. Yet, when you look through the Old Testament, you find that when there was spiritual renewal, it always centered around one of God's festivals. Inevitably, the times of spiritual renewal have always centered around God's festivals, but God's festivals haven't always been times of spiritual renewal for some of God's people. So many times, people have simply gone through the motions because they lost sight of what the festivals were all about. Why we do what we do. We see that it is the observance of the feast, the observance of the Feast of Tabernacles is very much tied in with God's law and with a refocus on God's law and, and the instructions of God's law. You can't separate God's law from God's way of life and from the blessings and the benefits of it and from the festivals. Because the Feast of Tabernacles looks forward to the time when the knowledge of God will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. It looks to a time when the knowledge of God's ways, the knowledge of God's laws will flow out from Jerusalem and will permeate every aspect and every facet of human society and culture. A time when they won't hurt or destroy in all God's holy mountain. 
Have you seen some of the pictures on television of the little children and, and the various people there in, in uh, Rwanda? This is the most recent spot. People dying. Horrible things. And you realize that over and over and over again, that's just a taste that's a prelude to greater catastrophes yet to come. Catastrophic events. People just hacking each other up with machetes. Well, time's coming when that's not going to be anymore. But it can't. that time can't come apart from the knowledge of God's law. You know, just religion, quote-unquote, is, is, is very empty apart from the substance of God's way, of God's law. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, speaking here of God's festivals, times that were designated to be times of spiritual renewal and restoration. Deuteronomy 14, in verse 22, You shall truly tithe all the increase of your seed that the field brings forth year by year, you shall eat before the eternal your God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of your corn, of your wine, of your oil, and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks, that you may learn to fear the eternal your God always. So here we find that God designates a tithe, not one that goes to the Levites, but here's one that is to be consumed before the eternal God in the place that he will choose... Why do we do that? Notice the latter part of the verse, that you may learn to fear the eternal your God always. First and foremost, the reason we go to the feast is to learn to stand more deeply in reverence and awe of God. You can't do that apart from God's law. So, we go there to do this, that we may learn to fear the eternal always. And, Instructions here, if it's too long away, if it's, uh, the journey is too far, too far to, to uh, lead your sheep or, or drive your, uh, your young bullock or to carry a sack full of grain, a simple thing to do. And, of course, what generally I guess all of us do, or pretty well all of us, uh, is uh, that they sold it, turned it into money, took the money. When they got there, bought what they needed. And verse 26, you shall bestow that money for whatever your soul desires, whatever you want. Speaking in the context of observing the feast, uh, oxen, sleep, uh, sheep, uh, wine, strong drink, whatever you, you desire, you shall eat there before the eternal your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. Now notice two or three things. It is a time of festivity, a time of rejoicing. But notice what it says in verse 26, You shall eat there before the eternal your God. You know, if that concept was clearly in mind, it would have solved a multitude of problems that have happened sometimes. We ought to be conscious of God's presence all the time and every time, but we certainly ought to be conscious even more of God's presence at the feast. We're there to eat before the eternal our God. I, I'll tell you, I have... In times past, at the feast, been at events that I think if people had looked up and seen Jesus Christ sitting down at the end of the table, uh, it would have changed the tenor of conversation considerably. Uh, you, you know, uh, that all of a sudden people would have gotten uncomfortable uh, with maybe how much they were drinking or with uh, some of the jokes they were telling or some of the things that were going on. Because they lost sight of the fact that they were there to eat before the eternal our God. We're there to observe a festival in the presence of God. First and foremost, it needs to be in our conscious mind that we're assembling before God. We're in the presence of God. We're there to rejoice in the presence of God. That's a time for rejoicing and for festivity. God doesn't go around, you know, with a with just a frown on his face all the time, and, and boy, he never laughs at anything. Just, you know, has this sour expression. Looks like he's been sucking on lemons all day. You know, sometimes I think that's the way people picture God. 
Uh, you know, God has a sense of humor. If you don't think so, go to the zoo sometime. You know, God designed that. In fact, you don't have to go to the zoo. I mean, you just stand on the street corner and watch people go by. Realize God has a sense of humor. You know, God's not against having a good time. God's not against laughing. But He wants it about the right thing. He doesn't want, uh, uh, you know, people dragging through the, uh, through the mire and through the mud uh, everything that God has made right and pure. But God says, rejoice before me. Make physical preparation, save up, come before me and rejoice. But remember, number one, you're there to learn to fear me. You're there to learn to stand more deeply in reverence and awe of me. And you're there to eat before me. You're there to share a meal at my pre- in my presence. You're there before me. And before me, end of verse 26, you shall rejoice, you and your household. So it's a time to rejoice, you and your household. It's a time for sharing. It's a time for giving. It's a time for rejoicing in the presence of God. And it is predicated upon adherence to the terms of the covenant, God's law. The basis of the festivals being times of spiritual renewal is a refocusing on the law of God. If we go back here in Deuteronomy chapter 31 again, Deuteronomy 31, we find that Israel is assembled in verse 11, the law is read. In verse 12, everybody is gathered together, the men, the women, the children, everybody there. Why? That they may hear. First, you've got to take in the information. Now, in their case, they generally had to hear it because most of them did not have access to the written word. They certainly didn't have access to the printed word. And if the only books you had were hand-copied, there wouldn't be very many books. I think we all understand that. Now, you can hear God speak whether you're hearing a sermon or whether you are reading God's Word and, and God is speaking to you through the pages of this book, the Bible. See, first we have to be instructed in the truth. And we have to have a heart and a mind that desires to be instructed. You see, we have to be teachable. So we have to come to the feast in a teachable spirit, in a teachable attitude. We need to have that attitude that we may hear. That we may be receptive, that we may take in the information. We take in the information, why? That we may learn. How do you go from hearing to learning? You remember what Joshua was told? See, just a few pages over in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua was told that this book, this is Joshua 1.8, the book of the law was not to depart out of his mouth. That meant he was never to get away from God's Word. But you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written. You meditate there in day and night. The way you go from, from hearing to learning is you think about what you heard. The way you go from reading God's Word to learning God's Word is you have to think about it. You have to meditate on it. That means you turn it over in your mind. You think about how that applies to you, how it applies to circumstances, how it applies to day-to-day things that you are going through and living. You see, God's Word has to move from being theoretical, from just simply being something that is written down or words that are spoken, it's got to move from being theoretical to being something practical and utilized in our lives. So you have to meditate on it. You have to think about it. That's all meditate means. You have to think about it. If it just goes in one ear and out the other, technically you may have heard it in the sense that you heard the sound. But if you don't think about it, then you can't, you can't learn it. That's one of the reasons that a lot of times it's helpful. Different people have different styles of notes. It's not that you've got to, uh, everybody's got to do it exactly the same way, whatever works for you. But uh, 
to, to uh, take note of, of important uh, things and to think about it, to talk to others about it, to discuss it. The feast is certainly a time for, for some of that. So you hear in order to learn, and you learn in order to fear. See, we don't learn just so we know something somebody else doesn't know. We've got some little technical uh, point of information, and I'm smarter than he is. You know, I know all seven horns and ten, or uh, seven heads and ten horns. You know, that, boy, that really uh, that, that really puts me one up. Well, the question is, do I really understand all ten commandments, and am I uh, am I doing something about them? You see, we learn in order to fear, to stand in awe and reverence of God. It has to do with our attitude and our perspective. Because a person can take in information. You can learn information and understand how it applies. But if you don't have an attitude of really standing in awe of God, well, yeah, I know I know it says so and so, but I, the way I see it, I, I don't see why that ought to apply. And, and, and I, I, I don't like to do it that way. And I, I don't want to do so and so. I like to do this. And that's not an attitude of the fear of God. No, the fear of God stands in awe of God. Recognizing the power and the greatness and the glory of God doesn't mean you're all cowering in a corner somewhere, but you do recognize the awesome might and power of God, and you stand in awe of Him, deeply impressed. I'll guarantee you the people there at the dedication of the temple under Solomon were impressed with God. Well, the fire came down from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, the glory of the Lord filled the house, scared them all to death. But it didn't last, did it? Didn't last. The carnal mind is impressed with miracles for the moment. But then quickly, they lose sight of that, focus on something else, and it's like, what have you done for me lately? Well, we're to come to God every year at the festival periods as times of spiritual renewal. We come in order to take in information, in order to learn, in order to fear, to stand more deeply in awe of God, because that leads to observing to do all the words of the law. If you really stand in awe of God, then you're going to you're, you're going to really put forth effort to observe it, to put it into practice. See, the, the festivals were designed to be times of spiritual renewal. When we go through the scriptures, we find there have been times of spiritual renewal. They always centered around the festivals, but very rarely did they occur. Most people went along year after year, feast after feast, going through the motions, never really utilizing it in the way that God intended. Real spiritual renewal centers around a rededication to God's ways. Letting God order our lives through His words, through His laws. If we're to worship the true God, we're to worship Him in spirit and in truth. God reveals Himself. You know, the best the, the ancient pagan Greeks could do was to worship the unknown God. I mean, the best thing they had going for them was an altar that they didn't know what. That wasn't much. You remember the story back in Acts 17. Paul says, Him whom you ignorantly worship, I declare unto you. We can know the true God because the true God declares and reveals Himself. But we must worship Him in spirit and in truth according as He has revealed. And so we find that whenever there were periods of restoration, periods of revival and renewal, that the first thing that was cleared away was the old false concept, was the idols, the high places, the groves, all of the things that smacked of paganism or the taint or influence of paganism and a refocusing on the law. As we're coming before God at the Feast of Tabernacles, we need to, to think in terms that the time is coming in the years ahead of us when all nations will come up to Jerusalem to keep the feast. You read about that in Zechariah 14. And we're coming to a time when the God of heaven will make a feast of fat things for all nations and all people. And all of the horror and all of the calamity 
that fills our news magazines and newspapers and, and radio news and television news, those things will be things of the past. We're coming to celebrate a time when the desert will blossom like a rose. A time when they will not hurt or destroy in all the holy mountain of God. A time when the knowledge of God will cover the earth the way the waters cover the sea. But brethren, we've been called to have an opportunity to understand those ways right now. To have an opportunity of being a part of ultimately sharing it with the whole world the time to come. As we approach the festival, sure we need to make physical preparations. We're physical creatures. Everything we do involves physical effort. Even our spiritual efforts involve physical efforts. If you get out and pray, that takes a certain amount of physical effort. Uh, just of, of uh, you know, you get out on your knees. Maybe they crack and creak a little bit. And, uh, you know, you stay in one position for a while, you begin, the body gets tired. The spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. The point is, everything we do involves physical things. And, and the feast is certainly a time for physical festivity and rejoicing. Well, we've got to keep it in perspective as we start making our reservations and our housing arrangements and our travel arrangements and this arrangement and that arrangement. We need to be thinking that we are coming on a very close countdown to the festival. We're just over six weeks away from the Feast of Trumpets, the first of the fall festivals. We're getting close. It is, a time, it is something to be excited about and happy about. But along with that anticipation, it builds in a physical aspect. Let's build anticipation for the spiritual aspect. Let's make spiritual preparation to where we come to the feast receptive, to be instructed, to be taught, to learn God's way more fully and more deeply. That we can come away renewed in a positive way. As God would have us to. Utilizing the festivals, this fall festival, in a way that God designed his festivals to be. To continually bring us back to a refocusing of His plan, of His way. An opportunity for our spiritual renewal. Because we all need to continue to refocus and to renew. As we do that and as we make those kinds of preparations, brethren, we're laying the groundwork for what truly can be the best feast ever.